All right. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. Ah, so uh, let's let's. Hold on, I'm getting. Go. All right. Let's talk about uh, the exams first. The scores were. Um, trying to think of a good word. Uh, depressing, I guess, is the best I can come up with. Uh, despite my warnings, um, it was uh, it was a bloodbath, quite frankly, especially the lab exam. Um, and it's frustrating, too, because, again, one of the things that I keep trying to emphasize to you guys is that, again, you have to be really, really smart and sophisticated in the way that you're attacking these questions. Uh, I understand that this information was challenging. I understand this information was tough. But at the same time, uh, you have to pay attention to the questions. You have to think about what the questions are asking you. If I'm asking you for uh, to identify a particular tissue type and you tell me lacuna, right? The lacuna is a space. It's not a tissue type. Or if I ask you to identify a structure and you say that it's a simple squamous epithelial tissue, right? Those are not the right types of answers. So again, you really have to pay attention to the question. Uh, again, it's always true, but in this next test, it's going to be especially important as well, because I'm going to point at a bone feature of a bone and you're going to need to, you know, read the question carefully. I may ask if the bone is left and right. I may ask for the bone. I may ask for the bone feature. I may ask for the bone and bone feature that articulates with it. I may ask for the skeletal feature. I may ask for the bones and bone features that make the skeletal feature. Again, you got to read the questions carefully and make sure that you're providing appropriate types of answers, right? Like I said, there's, there's, if I'm asking for something based on its location, right, there's only a handful of those that we've had. So you know it's got to be something like a mesothelium or a perichondrium or a lamin appropriate or something along those lines. So do please try to read the questions carefully. The lecture exams were a little better. Uh, again, these averages uh, are not necessarily indicative of how the class did. Uh, basically, what happened is we had uh, some people who did, a lot of people who did really, really well, and a lot of people who did really, really poorly. And so that is kind of why the averages are where they are. <coughs> The good news is uh, twofold. One is I reminded you, you can replace any lecture exam with your uh, with the final exam, your lowest lecture exam. So these can go away if this was your lowest one. Uh, and the other piece of good news is that your grade in this class is not based just solely on the exams, but on all of the points in this class. And the average is a 73%. So at this point in the class, that's not a horrible place for us to be. I would like very much for that to come up another six or seven points. But again, as you guys continue to learn, uh, one of the things that I've always said in this class is there are two things you have to do to be successful. Obviously, you have to be able to cram large amounts of information into your brain in a short period of time. But the other thing you need to do to be successful in this class is to be able to present that information that you've crammed into your brain onto the exam. Taking a test is a skill just like shooting a basketball is a skill. And the best way to get better at it is to practice it. The same way if you wanna get better at shooting a basketball, you stand outside for an hour throwing the ball at the hoop. The same thing with taking an exam, right? Write practice essay questions. Uh, there are all sorts of quizlets and uh, your, uh, modified, uh, your modified mastery name, P has practice tests and practice quizzes that you can take. Practice expressing this information on paper. Uh, as a couple of you have done, if you want to write practice essay questions and send them to me, I will grade them for you to tell you what you're missing or, or what you're lacking or things along those lines. So I strongly encourage you to, to uh, focus on that. So not just cramming the information on the brain, but making sure you express that information onto an exam as well. Practice that so that you can be successful. You've now had two lab exams. You've now had two lecture exams. You know exactly what to expect for those. There are no more surprises, and you've got three more of them. So there is no reason that not everybody in this class should be able to uh, bring their grades up, right? improve on your tests. So practice those things, work on getting the information into your brain, and then also work on expressing that in a format that is going to maximize your points. And like I said, I'm happy to help those of you who need help with that. All right. Uh, oh, and like last time, after class today, I won't do it before class because, uh, again, yeah, then you'd all be looking at that and not listening to me. But after class today, I will release uh, the exams. 
uh, so that you can view the individual questions and any comments that I've put in there for you. Uh, again, the, the overall comments should be released, so make sure you're looking at and reading those. For those of you, there are a couple of important ones, so make sure you're reading and seeing those. And again, I will release the exams for 24 hours. So at noon tomorrow, I will lock them back up again. And at that point, if you uh, didn't get a chance to or need to see it again, uh, then you'll have to make an appointment with me to be able to do that. All right, so that is the exam information. Let's talk about our game plan. As I mentioned today, uh, for the next couple weeks now, we're gonna be basically doing the same thing. We're gonna finally be split, splitting up the lecture and the lab. In lecture, we'll be focusing on bone physiology. In lab, we'll be doing our group presentations starting today with the axial. And as I mentioned, uh, we should hopefully, we, let me rephrase that, we will get through all of the bones of the skull. So we're gonna focus on the skull for today and that is what we're gonna do for that. Wednesday, we will finish the rest of the axial skeleton and also on Wednesday after our group presentations, because if I do it beforehand, people focus on their material and now people are presenting. I will give you the appendicular bones that you will be responsible for and we'll be presenting those next week. Uh, you have four assignments due, unit review seven, eight, and nine, and then also that 30-point skeletal review, which yes, has not been released yet, because again, I want you focusing on learning the bones and bone features first, because that is going to help you to be more successful at putting those together. I will release that on Wednesday, so you'll have a full week to work on that, uh, and hopefully that will encourage you to learn the bones and bone features, which will make that review occur much quicker for you. And again, that will be graded for correctness. All leading up to three weeks from today. Three weeks, that doesn't sound right. Uh, where are we? One, two weeks. Two weeks from today uh, when we will have our uh, next lab and lecture exam. All right, questions on that? That is the game plan. Any questions on any of that material? Yes, uh, my question is about the lab exam, sir. Yes. Uh, however, uh, I'm sure that uh, I paid a lot of attention to the uh, the questions, like if it was structure, it was organelle, it was like surface or tissue type. So still uh, the, the, the grade. And well, so, so again, obviously when I'm making general categories like this, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about general trends that students have. I, I don't remember anybody's individual tests to know exactly what they did. But so what I would say is that when I release the exams this afternoon, I would strongly encourage you to look at your exam. And then if you have any questions or concerns either about the grading or about what you can do to be more successful on it, uh, then I'm happy to meet with you. Again, I have office hours right after class today for an hour. So it gives you plenty of time to go get something to eat, go look at your exam, and then uh, come to my office hours if you have any questions about it. I'm happy to do that for anyone and everyone. Because uh, again, my goal is, uh, is you know, look, I, I am just as disappointed with these grades as you guys are. I, I, I don't get any rewards for having you guys be unsuccessful in this class or anything like that. So I am your biggest fan. I'm your biggest, you know, I'm rooting for you guys to all be successful. One of the things I love about this class, as I've said, there's two things I love about this class. I love that this class is hard. So I don't have to be tricky. So I can be very straightforward with you about telling you X, Y, and Z is gonna be on the exam. I have no problem with that. And I purposely set the format of this class where it is, uh, it's not competitive, all right? If every single person in this class gets 90% of the points, every single person in this class can get an A. So one person's grade doesn't affect anybody else's in that fashion. And so towards that end, I'm here to help you to be successful. That's the whole point of why we're here. Like I said, the whole reason we're doing this format. It would have been incredibly simple for me to do this class asynchronously, and it would have been a lot easier for me, but I thought it would be a lot harder for the students. So I'm trying to do the things to help you to be successful. And if you're not being successful, then come to me and, and individually, I'm happy to work with you guys to help you to, to, to help those students who need it to become successful. All right. Okay. Alrighty, excellent. So let's put that behind us and like I said, move on to some fun stuff instead. All right, so any more questions on the game plan for the next couple of weeks or the previous exam? Alrighty. So as I mentioned uh, in lecture, we're gonna be focusing on uh, our bone homeostasis. There is a tremendous amount of physiology that goes on with our skeletal system. And so we're, we'll be talking about those processes. 
first thing we have to do is we have to make bones, right? And again, being the sophisticated students that you are, I will warn you right now that there are two methods by which we make bones, right? We start as a big ball of cells in developing inside of mommy's tummy, and we have to make mo bones. And so there are gonna be two methods for making those bones. Being the smart, sophisticated students that you are, how many possible essay questions can you usually get from something like that? Three. Three, excellent. What are they? Talk about each one individually and compare. There you go, exactly. Talk about each one individually and then compare them. And again, that's one of the other things that I wanna talk about, comparisons. One of the things that I saw on a lot of your essay questions is that if I, for instance, asked you to compare epithelial tissues and connective tissues, that isn't my way of saying I want you to describe both of them. I want precise comparisons. So saying that epithelial tissues are superficial and connective tissues have a matrix, while both of those things are true, they do not, they're not comparative in that way. I want you to compare them. So instead, you need to say that epithelial tissues are superficial while connective tissues are deep. Epithelial tissues are polar while connective tissues don't have a polarity. They don't have a top or a bottom to them. Epithelial tissues are cell dense, whereas connective tissues are more cell sparse and have more other materials, that matrix inside of them. I want direct comparisons. It doesn't mean describe A and describe B. I want direct comparisons. So make sure you're doing that with that. All right, so think about those types of essay questions that are gonna be present for these three, uh, for these three possible essay questions as we go through that. Now, once we make bones, we then need to grow our bones. And how many different ways are there gonna to be to grow bones? Right, when you think of those little baby bones that you were born with, right? Or if you look down to the left of you and see that little baby sitting beside you in class, right? How, how do you need to grow their bones? How many different ways? Two, exactly. You wanna grow them in width and you wanna grow them in length. So there are gonna be two methods for growing our bones, which of course reminds us that there will be three possible essay questions there. Now, most of us in this class have reached our ultimate height. Our epiphyseal plates, as we've talked about, have closed. However, that doesn't mean that our bones are different, are done being dynamic. There are three main factors that play an important role in helping us to maintain the healthy bones that we have. And of course, when we damage these bones, uh, we are going to need to heal them as well. So these are all the different physiological processes for bones that we need to talk about over the next two weeks. However, as we already hinted at in the previous class, we have this other issue with bones. Bones is where we store 99% of the body's calcium. But as we know, calcium is super vital for the functions of the body, All right? Calcium makes the cells do wonky things. And towards that end, uh, we need to keep very precise control of the calcium in our body. As we mentioned, I know everybody in this class had a nice big large breakfast, which included a big large glass of milk and maybe a slice or two of cheese making sure you got all that external calcium that was necessary inserted into your body. But as we talked about, believe it or not, some people will have a donut and a Diet Coke for breakfast. Are they necessarily getting the calcium that, they body, that their body needs? No, so does that mean that they'll just go without calcium on that day? No, what it means is that if we need calcium, if it comes down to a choice between having the right amount of calcium in our body and having big solid bones, Who's gonna win every time? Yeah, exactly, like you guys mentioned. We'll break down our bone uh, to get that calcium out of, our, uh, out of our bones, out of our teeth even, uh, to make sure that we have the right amount of calcium. So when we talk about the homeostasis of bone, we cannot forget about bone's role in maintaining calcium homeostasis. So we're gonna talk about that as well. So like I said, we've got a busy lecture for the next couple of weeks to talk about these things. So let's go ahead and get started.
Starting first with the formation of bones. As we mentioned, we start as that little bundle of cells, that zygote, that single cell that divides to become a cluster of cells, to become an embryo. And as an embryo, basically there is no bone tissue. Instead, it's got a lot of fibrous connective tissues and hyaline cartilage. And so our job as we're developing inside of mommy's belly is to convert uh, that fibrous cartilage and that hyaline, uh, pardon me, that fibrous connective tissue and that hyaline cartilage into bone. Well, I mentioned there are two different methods for making bones, and I mentioned that there are two different connective tissues involved in this process. So not surprisingly, they're each related to each other. Now this process of bone formation, what we call osteogenesis or ossification, starts relatively early, about week six or seven of development. And there are two main types. The first is endochondrial ossification. Again, fun with the vocabulary. Endo, of course, means what? Inside. Inside, and chondrial refers to? Chondrocytes. True, chondrocytes, which are, play a role in the making of cartilage, right? So Partly. chondrial refers to cartilage, so exactly. So endochondrial ossification tells you exactly what it is. We are making bone ossification within cartilage. All right. And the second method is intramembranous. Intra means between, membranous with within the membrane or between the membrane ossification. And this is where within that fibrous connective tissue we make our bones. All right. Let's talk about these processes. And we are going to talk about endochondrial ossification first. Endochondrial ossification is how we form most of the bones of the body, including all, oops, wrong button, including all of our long bones are going to be formed. So we know the anatomy of our long bones very well. So that is what we're going to uh, look at, the long bone and the long bone formation. However, before we can talk about endochondrial ossification, first, we have to talk about how we make cartilage models. After all, if the goal is to have a chunk of cartilage that is in the shape of the bone that we want, and then we want to convert that into our uh, bone, we need to learn how to make that cartilage model. And the reason for this is, as we've talked about before in this class, or maybe we haven't yet, although we should have, life is lazy. Once it learns a way to do something, the goal of life isn't necessarily to make that the most efficient thing possible. It's like once it learns how to do something, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. So many of these processes are things that used again and again and again. Like, for instance, on the last exam. Many of you had the question where you had to talk about the two healing processes, regeneration and fibrosis. Now it is true we used the example of skin when we were talking about that, but is skin the only tissue that regenerates? Is skin the only tissue that undergoes fibrosis? No. So those same healing processes, which you were supposed to describe, and many of you instead described the healing of skin instead, those healing processes are going to be used for most of the tissues in our body, one or the other. And it's the same thing here. We are going to talk about how we grow this cartilage model, but as we'll see, these are growth processes that we will use in other ways in our body, and in fact, in other ways in our bone as well. All right, so let's start with some of the things we know. We have our pluripotent stem cells, those mesenchymal cells that we know are pluripotent, can divide to become any of the cells associated with a connective tissue. And in this case, they're gonna divide to form chondroblasts. And once you get a chondroblast, that chondroblast is then going to produce matrix. And as we know, it will surround itself with matrix, and once it surrounds itself with matrix, we know that it is gonna be living in that lacuna, that space inside of the matrix that it is forming. So we're gonna use those chondroblasts to make our cartilage. 
And, in a point that I think in fairness I may not have emphasized as much as I should have based on the answers on your lab exam, there is a tissue that wraps around the outer surface of our cartilage. What tissue type is that? Periosteum? That is the tissue based on its location, this, this but what is, is the tissue type? Irregular dense connective tissue. There you go, dense irregular connective tissue. So we have a dense irregular connective tissue. Oops. <clears throat> that dense irregular connective tissue that, based on its location, because it wraps around a cartilage, is a perichondrium. And just as we saw in bone, as we talked about in last week, there are going to be mesenchymal cells that are gonna be housed under this perichondrium. And so this is the basic anatomy of what our highland cartilage model is going to look like big chunk of cartilage that is shaped like the bone we want, wrapped with a perichondrium that houses mesenchymal cells inside of it. However, what we have to talk about is how you form this model. And that will allow us to talk about two important growth processes. So again, I want to emphasize right now we're talking growth processes. This is not yet a part of endochondrial ossification. We haven't worked up to endochondrial ossification yet, but let's talk about these growth processes. Starting first, uh, let's see how we want to do this. There is my cartilage model. And inside my cartilage model, there is my lacuna. And inside of my lacuna is a chondrocyte, right? So this is my matrix, this is my lacuna, and that right there is my chondrocyte. Mesenchymal. So yeah, so let me, I, we can do that too. Uh, da, 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 da. I will cheat by just putting it on one side right here. So here is my dense irregular connective tissue. Now again, we know it wraps around the entire cartilage, but I'm just showing it on one side. That, based on its location, we call a perichondrium, because peri around chondrium cartilage. And underneath, it houses mesenchymal stem cells. Perfect. All right. Now, remember when we talked about bone, one of the things we said about bone, it is only that osteogenic cell that is capable of division. But that is not true in cartilage. This chondrocyte hanging out here inside of our lacuna is actually capable of dividing and producing a second cell. So now we have two chondrocytes living in the same room. And well, all of you may not have not had the opportunity to experience this. I have had the opportunity to experience this. If you take, say, for instance, two pre-teenage girls and try to get them to live in the same room, does that necessarily work very successfully? No, absolutely mm -hmm. not. And these two chondrocytes aren't happy living in the same room either. So what these two chondrocytes will start to do is they would start to, well, you're just going to have to take my word for it. Uh, they, what they're going to start to do is they're going to start to produce new matrix. And as they make this new matrix, right, they're expanding their matrix 
making new matrix, and especially as they're building new matrix between themselves, what happens is they start to expand the tissue from within. They're making new matrix from within and expanding the tissue from within. This type of growth where we get the expansion This type of growth where we're adding new matrix uh, from within the tissue, we call interstitial growth. Oops. Uh -oh. Oh. So this adding of new matrix from within the tissue, expanding the tissue from within, we call interstitial growth. And as I mentioned, life is lazy. Once it knows how to do a process, it's gonna use that process again and again. This same growth process will be used to grow the bones in length. Where do bones grow in length again? Where did we say when we were looking at the anatomy of our long bone, where did we say that growth in length occurred? Okay, well, that was a kind of in between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. Wasn't there a special structure where we said that was gonna occur? There you go, the epiphyseal plate. And what type of tissue is that epiphyseal plate again? What type of tissue is the epiphyseal plate? I'll wait if you have to look back or grab your textbook or Google it. Spongy bone? No, the epiphyseal plate in the metaphysis. You're right, spongy bone is in the epiphysis, but there was that line of tissue. No, there we go, Allison's got it. Highland cartilage, All right? What do we have here? Highland cartilage. So not surprisingly, the same growth uh, process that is used in Highland cartilage is used here to make our bone model, and it's also going to be used to grow the bone in length. And again, this type of growth process, as I mentioned, is called interstitial growth. However, as we pointed out over here, and I will cheat by drawing a second one over here without the perichondrium over the top of it, we have these mesenchymal cells that are embedded underneath the perichondrium. And as we know, mesenchymal cells divide. And when a mesenchymal cell divides, what it can do is make a new chondroblast. And what, of course, does a chondroblast do? Makes matrix. It makes new matrix. And so that is exactly what happens. We get a formation of more matrix that occurs on the outer surface. And then another one divides and we make more matrix around it. And another one divides and we make more matrix around it and so on and so forth. And so notice in this fashion, we can make our matrix, add matrix, we can grow, let's be consistent with our wording, growth of matrix by adding new matrix, not inside the tissue, but this side as layers on the outside of the model. And this type of growth we call appositional growth.
So what we are doing is we are adding new layers, more and more matrix on the outer surface, and this we call appositional growth. This growth process is going to be used to make our cartilage model, but it is also used to grow our bones in width. And if that wasn't enough, it is used to form our osteons. Remind me again what an osteon is? Organizing structure of the entire structure. Absolutely. Organizing structure of what? Bone. Not just any bone, but organizing compact structure bone. of compact bone. Exactly. So basically, this uh, appositional growth is not only going to make our bones wider, but it's also how we make our compact bone. So again, two very important growth processes. As always, I've done a truly amazing job of drawing this on the board, but let's take a look at the pretty pictures from your textbook to see if they help in understanding this process. Here is, a, again, much nicer example of that interstitial growth. Again, we have a single chondrocyte inside of a single lacuna. Uh, it divides. Right, doing the, one of the things that uh, osteocytes can't do, chondrocytes can divide inside of the lacunas, forming two chondrocytes. And those two chondrocytes continue to make matrix, pushing away from each other. And as they make matrix pushing away from each other to make their own spaces, their own lacunas, they expand the entire matrix, making the cartilage bigger. This is how we're gonna get a chunk of cartilage that is the shape of a bone. But like I said, this exact growth process, this interstitial growth is gonna be exactly what we use to grow the bone in length. All right, questions on that? All right, and here we see a nicer picture of that appositional growth. Again, notice here we have our matrix with our chondrocytes in their lacunas. Everything is a possible essay question. Um, well, so again, anything we talk about the class is definitely testable material. One of the, I don't know if fun is the right word, interesting, stupid, weird, I, I don't know what the right adjective is, but you have to remember, I don't know what's gonna be on your exam. Every single one of you gets a different exam. I have made a bank of test questions, of all the test questions I could think of, and they get randomly assigned to you. So I don't know if this is gonna be on the exam or not, but anytime there is a process, something that has steps in it, isn't that something that it could be a potential essay question? the part where you all emphatically say yes. Well, not sadly, I think it's a good thing. If it has steps, it's easier to understand, right? If you have steps, it's easier to explain and describe something, right? First, you make the first bunny ear, then you make the second bunny ear. The first bunny ear goes around the second bunny ear through the bunny hole, pull them tight, right? By describing the steps, I can show that I know the process of tying a shoe, right? So again, if you can describe things in steps and processes, then you know and understand and have mastered that information. So here is our perichondrium housing those uh, mesenchymal cells. Those mesenchymal cells are dividing, producing new chondroblasts, and those new chondroblasts are making cartilage, surrounding themselves with cartilage. And in this case, we are expanding the tissue by adding new layers of cartilage on the outside. So we can go grow cartilage from within and we can grow cartilage by putting more layers on top. And as I said, this is also how we will not just increase the width of cartilage, 
but this is also going to allow us to increase the width of our bone and make compact bone. Two incredibly important processes. All right. Questions on that? All right. Then we are ready for endochondrial ossification. As we've done many times when we have these elaborate processes, I'm going to go through it twice. For the first time, I'm going to do it on the whiteboard. And for this one, I strongly encourage you to just put your pens down, watch, think, listen, attend. If you're all furiously trying to write, then you're not giving your chance, yourself the chance to understand this information. So take a moment to just sit back. We'll go through it with all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words in just a minute. But for now, I really think it's important to just watch, think, listen, and focus on what's gonna happen. And I'll try to limit how much writing I do just so we can focus on the images and understanding this. Obviously, you can't draw this on the exam, but you need to be able to describe it in steps. But that's what we need to do, all right? So, in the interest of space, Right, again, it's normally these big, huge Dino sized bones. I'm not gonna have, I'm gonna basically just give us two thirds of the bone. So remember everything that top it happens in the top epiphysis is going to happen. Oh, I want this to be black. Uh, is gonna happen as well. So we have this bone, oh, that's not black either. There we go, all right. So we have this bone shaped structure Uh, made of cartilage. So again, this is our hyaline cartilage. Oh, that's what I meant to do. Hold on, let's do that. I want the blue. I changed my mind. Blue for cartilage. Ugh, the gravy. All right, so here is our bone. And as we know, this bone, we'll use light blue for it is going to have, and now I'll draw it on this side. We know the perichondrium is right next to the bone. However, on this side, I'm gonna cheat a little bit by pulling it away from the bone. That's not far enough away from the bone. Pulling it away from the bone uh, to know that there is the space underneath it for those mesenchymal cells. And I'll label all these things in just a minute. We also know that this is a cartilage model. So inside here are going to be lacunas. And I'm just gonna draw a couple of these. Draw a couple of these up here as well. And inside of these lacunas are our chondrocytes. All right, now let's go through and label everything just to make sure we totally understand all of it. And I'll do it small so we have room. So this again is our perichondrium. And someone remind me again, what type of tissue is this perichondrium again? Dense or regular connective tissue. Excellent, and I'm just gonna abbreviate that in the interest of space. We have mesenchymal. Stem cells, we have chondrocytes, and lacunas, lacunae, and this of course is hyaline cartilage. All right, that works. Now, we know that this is happily going along, making uh, new, these mesenchymal cells are dividing, producing new chondrocytes, those new con uh, chondroblasts, those new chondroblasts, so let's do that. Make a chondroblast. And then new chondroblast is going to make cartilage where it surrounds itself with cartilage and again, grows our bone model. And this tissue is happily doing this. But 
we want to change what's happening here. We want to make bone. So what we need to be able to do is we need to change the environment. We need to change the chemical signals so that we can modify and change the behavior of what is going on. And what's a great way to bring new chemicals into the area? In fact, what's the biggest difference between cartilage and bone? When we think of our connective tissues and think of cartilage and bone, well, both have, can have nerves in it, although you're right, but, uh, blood, uh, blah, 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 bone has much bigger uh, nerves in it, but there you go. Cartilage is avascular and bone isn't. And blood vessels, blood is a great way to bring a new chemical signal in. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to change the environment. We need to change the chemical signals. And the way that happens is we have a blood vessel grow into the perichondria. So the very first thing that happens, the very first thing that disrupts this process is we have a blood vessel into the perichondria. That brings new chemical signals. That brings uh, new, uh, uh, in, changes the environment, and those mesenchymal cells, which are pluripotent, now start making something different. Whereas before, the mesenchymal cells were dividing to produce chondroblasts, now our mesenchymal cells divide and make osteoblasts. Exactly. They divide and make osteoblasts. And so what's gonna happen is we get an osteoblast that forms here. Nope. We get an osteoblast that forms here. And that osteoblast is going to surround itself with matrix. And then another osteoblast forms and it surrounds itself with matrix. And slowly, we start producing a layer of matrix on the outer surface a layer of bone matrix on the outer surface of our diaphysis now notice one more thing we called this dense irregular connective tissue a perichondrium because it was sitting on top of cartilage. Right, is it sitting on top of cartilage anymore? These are the easy questions. Is it sitting on top of cartilage anymore? No, absolutely not. So that means it's still a dense irregular connective tissue, but we can't call it a perichondrium anymore. Instead, as was mentioned by Jayad, it is now a periosteum. Again, notice the tissue hasn't changed, its location hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is what it's sitting on top of. And what it's now sitting on top of is bone, so now technically we call it a periosteum. All right. While this is occurring on the outside, there are changes that are taking place on the inside. On the cartilage model. Primarily what happens is our chondro uh, blasts, which were dividing before and pushing away from each other, now instead what happens is our chondroblasts, or pardon me, chondrocytes, enlarge. The cells themselves get really, really big. Now, is there necessarily anything inherently wrong with a really big cell? Not really. I mean, it's not that big of a deal that it is a big cell. But here's the problem. A big cell needs a big lacuna.
And as the cells and their lacunas get bigger, notice the matrix between the cells thins. And when it thins, it hardens. So now we have these really big, really metabolically active cells. that have this hardened matrix between them, this thin hardened matrix between them. Is it gonna be easy for these cells to get the oxygen and the nutrients that they need? Is it gonna be easy for these cells to be able to get rid of their wastes if the matrix around them is really thin and it's starting to harden? No. And so because the matrix around the cell thins and hardens, what ends up happening is that the chondrocytes die. And when it dies, it leaves behind a hardened cavity. Kind of cavity that would be the perfect environment for us to grow something in. Of course, if we want to change the environment, if we want to bring new cells in here so that we can do some work, how are we gonna to need to do that? The blood vessel, exactly. Notice the exact same process that happened the first time is happening here as well. A large blood vessel called the nutrient artery grows into the diaphysis. So we have this nutrient artery that grows into the area. And when it grows into the area, it brings new chemical signals, it brings new cells. And here in the cavity our osteoblasts are gonna form. And of course, what do osteoblasts do? Not your question, these are the easy questions. What do osteoblasts do? Make matrix, absolutely. Now, whoops. When they're forming the matrix in here, they're starting to form bone matrix. Is this gonna be perfectly aligned, concentric layers of lamellae forming these perfect osteons within this space? No. We're gonna get all this irregular bones, all these irregular points and processes that form here in the center. And so what happens is we get a cluster of spongy bone that forms in the center of the diaphysis. And this cluster of spongy bone that is formed in the center of the diaphysis is called the primary ossification center, right? It's an ossification center. It is a center where bone is being formed. And of course, why is it the primary ossification center? What does primary mean? First, there you go, is the first one that forms. Excellent. Questions on this? All right, now, are we gonna be satisfied with just producing a small amount of spongy bone just here in the center of our diaphysis? No, of course not. So what's gonna happen is this primary ossification center is going to expand. And we're gonna start breaking down the cartilage and filling this space 
Yep, so trabeculi are forming in the center. That is correct. I was just asked that privately. Yes, so we're gonna get the formation of this spongy bone as that center expands within. At the same time, we have that bone cuff, that bone collar that formed on the outer surface, and that is going to continue to grow. And as it continues to grow, it forms compact bone on the outer surface. So what starts to happen is we get these dense layers of compact bone forming on the outer surface. And all this spongy bone forming in the center. However, is that what our mature long bone looks like? No, what's missing from this if this was a mature long bone? Compact bone? Well, we are forming the compact bone on the outer surface. So we are getting compact bone that is forming here on the outer surface. So that is happening. But what else is missing from our diaphysis here? If we were to cut open one of your long bones, would you find the entire center of your long bone would be filled with spongy bone? No, it'd be filled with yellow bone marrow in a big space. What did we call that big space? Medullary cavity. Medullary cavity, excellent. So while we're making all this spongy bone with osteoblasts, at the same time, osteoclasts are going to be active. So our osteoblasts make the bone and our osteoclasts oops, break down the bone and form the medullary cavity. And as you guys were partially right about, it helps if I guess medullary. There we go, cavity. And of course, this medullary cavity is going to fill with what? Red bone marrow, excellent. Remember, our uh, yellow bone marrow doesn't form until we are much more mature. All of our bone marrow as an infant is red bone marrow. So notice what we have here. We have a thick compact bone outer shell. We have a thin layer of spongy bone lining the inner surface and a big medullary cavity filled with red bone marrow. At this point, our diaphysis is complete. Right? It looks like what our uh, long bones medulla, uh, I mean diaphysis should look like. And remember, when did we say this process started? Six to seven weeks. Yeah, it begins. Round week six or seven. And this process of completing the diaphysis occurs pretty early. Pretty early in development. Starts early and we complete our diaphysis early in the process. Right? When you take that 20 week um, ultrasound, right? You can start to see the bones in the fingers and the ribs and all this and the vertebral column and all that kind of fun stuff. All right. But notice we're not done with our long bone yet. We haven't done anything with the epiphysis. All right. And that doesn't occur till much later. What's interesting well, there's many interesting things about this process, but one of the interesting things about the process is that development 
of the epiphyses not occur until much later in the growth process. In fact, it typically occurs right before, right before birth or shortly after birth. Any of you ever held a newborn baby before? All right. When you do that, have you ever played with their hands or messed with their fingers or their, or their toes at that point? They're all bendy and rubbery. The reason they're all bendy and rubbery is because the heads of the bones of their phalanges haven't formed yet. They don't form till after birth. All right. So this development of the epiphysis occurs much, much later in the growth process, either right at the time of birth or shortly after. Yep, you're right, I spelled that right. I have lots of spelling errors, but you get the idea. Growth process, there you go. I, I'm not one of those people that walk and chew gum very well. So trying to talk, write, type, draw all at the same time, it's a, it's a horrible, horrible mess. But hopefully you get the idea. All right, but, when we finally get to right before birth, when we finally get to uh, right after birth, guess what? The growth process is going to occur the exact same way. We want to convert this cartilage into bone. So how do you think that process starts? What happened first in the diaphysis? Blood vessel forms. Even before the blood vessel came in, what happened? What was the first thing that happened? You're absolutely right. Second thing, absolutely, is a blood vessel grows in. But what happened even before the blood vessel grew into the diaphysis? Chondrocytes? What happened to the chondrocytes? We have more than one living in the lacuna. Not so much that there's more living in the cuna. Remember, it wasn't so much that they were dividing, but what weird thing happened to the chondrocytes in the diaphysis? They were producing matrix on the inside? That was at the very, very beginning when we made the model. But before, the, before that nutrient artery could grow in, a cavity had to form. How did that cavity form? It, it, something died. Yeah. Not so much that they expanded, but you get the right idea. The chondrocytes enlarge. The chondrocytes, remember, got bigger. And when the chondrocytes got bigger, the matrix thins. And when the matrix thins, what happened to the chondrocytes? They die. Yep. Excellent. Our chondrocytes then die. Leaving a cavity. And then you guys are absolutely right. Once we have that cavity, a blood vessel is gonna grow in through the neck. So that is going to be our metaphyseal artery grows in and brings new cells. Osteoclasts to break down the matrix and osteoblasts. And we start making, well, let's not start, let's say it this way. Makes a cluster of, and what kind of bone do you think is gonna form in here? Compact or spongy? Spongy, there you go. Cluster of spongy bone forms. And guess what we call this cluster of spongy bone that forms here in the epiphysis? Primary ossification center. Well, we already had the primary, so what do we need now? Secondary. Secondary. 
course, why is it called the secondary ossification center? Just it happens second. It happens second. However, there's another trick to this as well. How many primary ossification centers form in a long bone? One. One. How many secondary ossification centers form in a long bone? More than one. Two, because there's two epiphyses, right? If we think of our long bone, there's two epiphyses. And even though we're only seeing it on one end, it has to happen in both, uh, so occurs in both epiphyses. Epiphyses, so two form. And that's how I remember. One primary happens first, secondary happens second, but also one primary, to secondary. So we are going to form all of this spongy bone here in our epiphysis, our secondary ossification center. Notice up till now, what happened in the primary ossification center is the exact same thing that happened in our secondary ossification center. All right, so both of these, move this up, move this up, move this up have been identical in the processes. But now things are gonna be different. Secondary ossification center. There are gonna be two big differences between what happens in our secondary ossification center and what happened in our primary. Let's see if you guys can figure out the easy one first. What do you think one of the big differences between the formation of our primary and our secondary ossification center is? More red marrow instead of yellow? True, there is, well, remember, it's all red bone marrow at this point, uh, so, it's, so it, you are, you've got the right idea. Red bone marrow fills the space, but normally, like we saw in the diaphysis, that red bone marrow filled a medullary cavity. Does our epiphysis have a medullary cavity? No, it goes between the trabecula. Exactly. So here we make spongy bone and leave it, right? We do not form a medullary cavity. All right, so that is gonna be one of the big differences. So all the spongy bone that forms here stays spongy bone but there's one other big difference. And that is, notice with our diaphysis, was there any cartilage left? No. But here in our epiphysis, we do not convert all the cartilage to bone. Instead, we leave cartilage in two locations. Where are the two locations where we are going to leave the cartilage? Someone give me one of them. Epiphyseal line? Plate? Well, a plate, absolutely, you're right. So we are gonna leave it here in the metaphysis, and that is going to become the epiphyseal plate. So one of those is the epiphyseal plate. And what do we use that epiphyseal plate for again? Growth in length. Excellent. Where else are we going to leave hyaline cartilage? At the end, articular cartilage. There you go, perfect. We are going to leave it on the outer surface. We leave the hyaline cartilage as the articular cartilage, which is where we're going to form the joint. And there you go. Now our epiphysis looks like a mature adult epiphysis. big, huge spongy bone core with a little bit of hyaline cartilage left on the end to form the joint and a little bit of hyaline cartilage left in the metaphysis 
to form the growth plate. Excellent. And just that easily, we have converted a chunk of highland cartilage into a long bone. All right, questions on that? All right, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Looking at the time, this is a perfect place to stop and let this thing sink in. Then after we let this sink in, what we will do is we will come back and go through the entire process again with all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words. And yes, I will save this picture and I will post this picture as well. So yeah, but we'll go through all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words, but let's go ahead and take a break first, let this sink in, and then after this sinks in, right, exactly. So since you didn't take any notes here, we're gonna go through the entire process again with all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words from the textbook. So we'll go through that again, but I want you to let this sink in first, and then we'll come back and do that when we're all fresh. All right, so I promise you we will do it a second time. All right. It is 9.15, so let's come back at 9.30, and we will pick up the lecture from there. Would you mind moving that? Sorry? Moving that center text box. I just wanted to read something behind. What do I have covered? Oh, I didn't know that center text box that uh, in the office. That diaphysis. Oh, the words back there? You wanted to see what was back here? Is that what you're asking me for? Yes. Um, I'm not 100% sure and I can do that. Uh, let's see what I can figure out. Uh, if you can't, it's, uh, it's okay. I was just wanting to see a couple things. Yeah. Well, I can certainly move that, although I don't think that necessarily makes it easier. That's a, it's okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Sorry. See, now that I moved it, I can't put it back underneath. There. That should make it a little bit easier. There you can see the things that were there before, and this part was over here. So we'll cheat and put a box around that because that goes in the center. All right. So I'll meet you back here at 930. Let's go ahead and get started. So, as promised, we have gone through it once uh, without making any notes or anything. So again, let's go through the entire process again of how uh, we convert a uh, bone, uh, we convert a cartilage model into bone. So again, this is our endochondrial ossification, as I mentioned. This is the most common type of bone formation and how we form all the long bones. So we have this cartilage model and with this cartilage model, we need to change the conditions, we need to change the environment, we need to change this, the chemical signals that are present. And that starts with a blood vessel. So the first thing that happens is a blood vessel grows into the perichondrium, bringing new chemical signals. And the big key to those chemical signals is we get a change in the mesenchymal cells. Whereas before, those mesenchymal cells were dividing to form chondroblasts, they are now changing to form osteoblasts. Again, they're pluripotent, they can form any of the stem cells, and the new chemical signals that that blood vessel brought in changes what those mesenchymal cells do. And so what we start to get is this thin layer of bone that is gonna form on the outer surface of our cartilage model. What we call the bone cuff or the bone collar. Either of those are acceptable terms. And again, fun with vocabulary. 
that dense irregular connective tissue that is housing the mesenchymal cells was sitting on top of hyaline cartilage. So we called it a perichondrium. But now it is sitting on top of bone. So what do we call it now that it's sitting on top of bone? Periosteum. There you go, periosteum. Excellent. All right, again, we often say we name things based on their location. Technically, its location changed, so its name's changed, right? Histologically, it is exactly the same thing, but it's just in a different location. Excellent. All right. Now, at the same time that this is going on on the outside, there are some changes that are going on on the inside of our cartilage model, all right? are not so much the cartilage enlarges as the chondrocytes. I don't like that, let's change the wording of that, hold on. So it's more the chondrocytes that are enlarging. There it is. All right, so our chondrocytes are enlarging. And as those chondrocytes enlarge in the center of our cartilage, it thins the matrix. The matrix hardens, right? And as it hardens as a result of that, those chondrocytes die. And what we're left with is this cavity in the center of our diaphysis. Right. Life hates a vacuum, life hates a void, so we need to fill that cavity up. And how are we gonna get the new cells? How are we gonna get the new chemical signals into this environment so we can grow something in this cavity? Blood vessels. A blood vessel, exactly. That nutrient artery. One of the things that I would point out to you if we were in the classroom and you get to hold the bones in your hand, but it's still something you can look at at the pictures. When you're holding the bones in your hand, especially the long bones, when you look at the long bones, you can actually find this, a hole in the diaphysis where that nutrient artery enters into. It's one of the things you should look for on the pictures of the long bones as you're looking at it. They, you can actually see that big hole that that nutrient artery penetrates into the diaphysis. And there at the center, we form a small chunk of spongy bone. And of course, that small chunk of spongy bone that forms is our primary ossification center. Of course, it starts as a small chunk of spongy bone, but does it stay a small chunk of spongy bone? No, it's gonna expand and it's gonna grow towards both ends and it fills the diaphysis. With spongy bone. Which is great because we are converting cartilage to bone, which is what we want. However, is that what we want our adult bone to look like? Solid spongy bone throughout the diaphysis? No, so we need to hollow it out. Oops. All right, so again, we fill this with spongy bone, but that's not ultimately what we want our mature bone to look like. So now we have to complete the development of the diaphysis. Osteoclasts are gonna to start to break down the spongy bone and remove most most of the spongy bone, not all of it. Remember, when we saw in the models, there is a thin layer of spongy bone lining the inside of the medullary cavities. 
So it removes most of the spongy bone, leaving that medullary cavity. And then of course, we are going to fill that medullary cavity with red bone marrow. And as someone also mentioned at this point, this will also be when the endosteum is going to form, right? While they're forming that red bone marrow, we're gonna form that endosteum as well. Of course, if we want this diaphysis to have some strength, to have some integrity, we need to continue to form thick layers of compact bone on the outer surface. And so from that bone cuff, we get the formation of dark compact, not dark, but uh, thick compact bone on the outer surface. And now our diaphysis looks like what a mature diaphysis should look like. Our development is complete. But notice, just the development in the diaphysis. We haven't done anything with the epiphyses yet. Nor are we, at least not right away. Right? The formation of those secondary ossifications occur, uh, secondary ossification centers, and really we should put an S there, plural, to make sure we remember that there are two secondary ossification centers that form. They occur much, much later, around the time of birth, or even in some cases, shortly after birth. For the most part, the process starts the same. Our chondrocytes enlarge and die, a blood vessel grows into the area, and we form spongy bone, right? Those first three steps are the same for both the primary and the secondary ossification centers. However, where this process is different is in two ways. One is that we leave the epiphysis, the spongy bone. We do not hollow it out. We do not form a medullary cavity. And what was the second way they were different again? Someone want to remind me? The surrounding cartilage. The articulate. Right. Perfect. Absolutely. Here, we are not going to convert all the cartilage into bone. Some of the cartilage is going to remain. In fact, we keep it in two areas. We keep hyaline cartilage on the outer surface of the bone. That hyaline cartilage becomes our articular cartilage. And what is the function of that articular cartilage again? Cushion at the joints. Yeah, to form the cushion at the joint, absolutely. And the other place we leave it is in the epiphyseal plate, in the metaphysis, and what is its function? Yeah, growth, and more specifically, growth in length. Don't forget the in length part, because remember, we also are gonna have to grow bones in width. So again, that, that's a perfect example of an answer that while 100% correct, is not necessarily specific enough to get you all of the uh, points on the exam. If on the lab exam, I had a picture of a long bone and I had an arrow pointing to the epiphyseal plate and I asked you the function and you just said growth, that would not get you full credit. We wanna make sure we're precise. Growth in length. Growth in length is what we want, okay? Excellent, and there you go. Just that easily, we have made a bone out of cartilage. We have described the process of endochondrial ossification. Questions on that? All right, excellent, now notice, as we talked about, what caused all of the changes to occur in this bone is the growth of those blood vessels. One of the big differences between cartilage and bone is bone is very well vascularized. And it starts with three different types of blood vessels growing into three different types of areas. But as we've seen, bones are highly vascularized. So do you think these blood vessels stay independent of each other? 
No, in fact, when we look at a mature bone, we can see the starting point, right? If we look closely in a microscopic view of the periosteum, we can see where those periosteal blood vessels grew into the periosteum. We can see where the nutrient artery came in. We can see where the metaphyseal arteries came in. But we can also see how all of these blood vessels are all gonna grow together. So while we started with three distinctly different blood vessels, they all grow together into one location, all become interconnected, uh, which is why bone is so dynamic, why it's able to heal so rapidly, why it is constantly being broken down and built back up dynamically because it has such a massive blood supply to it. And of course, anywhere these blood vessels go, you know there's gonna be lymphatic vessels and there are gonna be nerves that follow along as well. So not only is it well vascularized, but it's also well innervated, which is why it hurts like heck when you break them. All righty. Excellent. Now, while endochondrial ossification is the primary way, the way that most bones are formed, it isn't the only way because most isn't all. So the other process we have to talk about is intramembranous ossification. And let's go through this one twice as well. It's not quite as elaborate as the endochondrial ossification is, but it's still uh, worth taking the time to go through it um, twice. So again, our goal here is now intramembranous ossification. This is how we form, for instance, uh, some of the flat bones of the skull. Uh, the mandible uh, and some other bones along those lines as well. And again, the key this time is we are growing the bone within a fibrous membrane. within a fibrous connective tissue. Notice I keep saying fibrous connective tissue. I don't keep say dense irregular or dense regular or elastic connective tissue. I just keep saying a fibrous membrane. The reason for that is this is an embryonic tissue, which is not quite the same as what we see in the adult tissues that we've talked about in the body. So rather than worrying about identifying it or labeling it, we're just gonna refer to it as a fibrous membrane. However, the fibrous membrane as one would suspect, contains a large number of collagen fibers. So let's draw a bunch of collagen fibers here all over the place with different orientations to them. And not surprisingly, there's gonna be a large number of mesenchymal cells. So I'll put one there and put one here and here and here and here. I know I'm just changing in size, but you get the idea. So again, a couple quick labels. Fiber. All right. And that's it for our anatomy really from a starting point. All right, so again, Let's just go through this once while you sit back and think and listen about this, and then we will add uh, to it from there. As we know, mesenchymal cells divide, and as they divide, they produce new cells. And one of the things that these mesenchymal cells can produce is osteoblasts. So what's gonna happen is our osteoblasts form. And as we know, osteoblasts like to surround themselves with matrix. And so that is what they're going to do. They are gonna make a little bit of matrix, surround themselves with matrix. And once they surround themselves with matrix, they are going to be locked in a lacuna and will be an osteocyte. And then another one forms and another one forms and another one forms. And so what happens is we get these clusters of osteoblasts forming matrix, surrounding themselves with matrix, 
and becoming osteocytes. So they form, they make matrix, they become osteocytes locked in their lacunas, and we, they cluster together. Well, a cluster of these osteocytes surrounded by bone sound an awful lot like an ossification center. And that's exactly what these become. They form an ossification center. Now notice what I said there. I just said ossification center. I didn't say primary or secondary or tertiary or quaternary or anything like that. I just said ossification center. We use primary and secondary for the uh, endochondrial ossification because one occurred first and then the second occurred after that. And if there had been a third after that, that we would have used tertiary for that one and so on and so forth. However, this one is not going to be the only one that forms, but do these necessarily form sequentially? If we're going to make a bone, we're going to need a lot of ossification centers but it's not like one happens first and then a second and then a third. So what happens is we form an ossification center, but many form all at the same time. And again, all the same approximate time. My, is one gonna form slightly before the other one and one slightly after another one like that? Yes, but is, it the, is that sequence important? No. So an ossification center is gonna form here and another ossification center is gonna form here, and another one is gonna form here, and another one is gonna form here, and another one 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 here, and so on and so forth. All these ossifications are going to form all over the place. Yeah, so approximately simultaneously. Again, is every single one of them gonna form instantaneously at the exact same time? No but we're talking about you know minutes, hours, days in, in proximity to each other, close enough where it's not a purposeful sequence, right? And that's really the key to this. There isn't a pur purposeful sequence to them, and that's why we just use the term ossification center, is because they're going to eventually all start to form. Now, just like before, these ossification centers are gonna be little clusters of bone, but they're not going to stay in just one location. They're going to start to expand out. And as they start to expand out, they're going to start to connect to the ones that surround them. They're going to grow into each other. And notice, as these are growing into each other, they're going to form all these layers of matrix that aren't uniform in their structure. We have all these irregular points and processes that are going to start to form. And what was that term we used for the organizing structure? All of these irregular points and processes that make up our spongy bone? No, osteon, oh there it is, trabecula. Excellent. So notice what happens is our ossification centers expand and grow into each other. And as they do that, they form our trabeculae. Our trabeculae of spongy bone. And what happens is this core of spongy bone expands. So we keep making this chunk of spongy bone, and as we make this chunk of spongy bone, it expands and it gets bigger. We start forming these trabeculae. Now, actually I'm gonna cheat and put this back up here. As the spaces form in between the trabeculae, so obviously there are spaces As the spaces form between the trabeculae, we don't like spaces, we don't like voids, we don't a lot like empty things. Life doesn't like voids. So we need to fill it with something. What would be convenient to fill the spaces within these trabeculae with? 
red bone marrow. And how are we going to get that red bone marrow in there? Blood vessels. Bingo, exactly. So as these spaces form between the trabeculae, blood vessels grow in to the spaces. As they grow into the spaces, they deposit our red bone marrow into the spaces. And so our bone, our blood vessel grows into this area. And as it grows into this area, we start to fill these spaces with our red bone marrow. Excellent. Now, one other thing is gonna be happening as well. Notice as this bony tissue expands, what it's gonna do is it is gonna start pushing up on the fibers around it. So let's write this up here. As the spongy bone expands, it pushes on the membranes and more specifically on the fibers of the membranes, of the membrane plug singular, that surrounds it. And as that happens, right, as you start pushing on those fibers, those fibers are gonna collapse down on top of the bone. Now, are these fibers that are gonna form are they gonna condense down in a very orderly fashion? Where they're all gonna align perfectly and precisely along the outer surface of this? No, of course not. So as they condense down, what happens is they form a dense, irregular connective tissue. That dense, irregular connective tissue is going to capture those mesenchymal cells and put those mesenchymal cells right up against the surface of the bone. And now I have a dense irregular connective tissue that has a bunch of mesenchymal cells sitting on it all over the outer surface of this bone. What have I just made? The periosteum. Exactly. So what happens here is we form a periosteum on the outer surface. And if you think about it, when we made our long bone underneath that periosteum, those mesenchymal cells were able to put a dense layer of compact bone on the outer surface. And that's what's gonna happen here as well. We are gonna get this dark, dense, I keep saying dark, I don't know why I keep saying dark. This uh, dense layer, so we form a thin layer of dense compact bone on the outer surface. Which as we've learned is the cortex. Right, so we form that cortex on the outer surface. If you think about it, this is pretty much the anatomy of a flat bone, a short bone, and a regular bone. We have a thin cortex of compact bone on the outer surface. We have trabeculae on the inside filled with red bone marrow. And of course, if this was a flat bone, which it could very easily be, what would that name based on the location we would give to the trabeculae that are located on the inside of this flat bone? There we go, diploe. Perfect, those diploe there. And so really, now all that is left, all that is left last, is then the remodeling of the bone. We are gonna use osteoblasts and osteoclasts Oops, I'm gonna move this out of my way. to form the bone into the shape we want. 
So let's say, for instance, we don't need this peak up here. I can use my osteo class to kind of break down the bone, removing that edge there. But at the same time, maybe I need to expand the edge over here. I can get more osteoblasts to form here to make this side larger, right? I removed the curve on this side and now suddenly the bone has the shape that I want. So using those osteoblasts and those osteoclasts together, I can remodel and reform this bone into the precise shape that I want. And just that simply, we have made a bone inside of a fibrous membrane. This is our intramembranous ossification. Oh, I see what I did there. I wrote that in the text here. So let me. Copy that, put that back up here. Perfect. All righty, and there, just that easily, we have made a bone inside of a fibrous membrane. Questions on that? All right, let's do it again. So, again, this is how we're gonna make our flat bones, the skull, the mandible, right, some stuff like that. It starts with the formation of our many ossification centers. Mesenchymal cells, which we see here, divide, cluster, and form osteoblasts. So we get a bunch of osteoblasts which form together. And osteoblasts do what osteoblasts are going to do. They are going to make matrix, right? Take that calcium, take that phosphate, take that carbonate, and deposit it on all these collagen fibers. Right? Osteoblasts form spongy bone surround themselves with matrix and become osteocytes. Now here, we are just seeing it at one location, but remember many of these ossification centers are all occurring together. So many of these form. It's not just one. Many ossification centers are formed. An osteoid? Great question. It is not a uh, it is not a term you are responsible for, but the osteoid is the uh, basically it are the calcium crystals as they are forming on the collagen fibers, and they're what fuse together to form the matrix. So once it's a layer, we call it the matrix. We call it the lamella. But as those individual crystals are are forming, they're technically called osteoids. But again, remember, osteoid is not a vocabulary term you're responsible for, so you don't have to worry about that. But that does answer your question if you're, if you're, if you're confused. All right. So many of these form, and then they grow into each other. As they grow into each other, we can see that we start to get those interstitial lamellae. We start to get those trabeculae. And once those trabeculae form, there's all these spaces, all these gaps in between them. So blood vessels grow into these gaps. And as the blood vessels grow into these gaps, they fill this space with red bone marrow. Uh, number two was um, clustering. So one was clustering of the mesenchymal cells. Uh, two is the differentiation to form the ossification centers. All right. Notice at the same time that the blood vessels are growing in, we're starting to get the condensing of the mesenchymal cells. They haven't shown us the fibers here, 
but they can show us how these mesenchymal cells are being condensed down on the trabeculae. And as they're condensed down on the trabeculae, we form that periosteum. Of course, once that periosteum forms, then we can start producing an organized layer of compact bone on the outer surface, what we call the cortex. And then, like I said, and then if this was a, a flat bone, these trabeculae on the inside would be known as the diploe. And then our only go goal is to remodel the shape of the bone. Using osteoblasts and osteoclasts, we can add bone or remove bone to make it the shape we want it to be. All right, questions on that? All righty. Process one, process two. Questions on either of those? Excellent. Blank stares, stunned silence. Tells me I've mastered the material and that is spectacular. That makes me happy. However, as we've talked about being the sophisticated students that we are, we have two processes, but how many possible essay questions? Three. There you go. So let's do that. Let's compare the two processes. Now, again, you are not required to organize it this way on the exam but because it is important for you to make sure that you are actually comparing apples to apples, one of the things that I like to do when I'm doing this is do it kind of like a table. I want to talk about the characteristics of endochondrial ossification, and I want to uh, talk about the characteristics of intramembranous ossification. So I want to have both of those. But to make sure what I'm really doing is actually a comparison of the two, I want to, and over here in my third column, have the characteristic that I'm actually comparing. So why don't you guys help me fill out my chart? Give me an example of a characteristic by which endochondrial ossification and intramembranous ossification are different. Okay, what do you mean by that? Haley? Okay, but that's not really a comparison. Once again, you're just describing them. So it t what it sounds like you're trying to say to me is you want to compare the starting tissue for the process, right? Starting tissue for the process of intramembranous ossification is indeed a fibrous uh, membrane is our starting point. Whereas what would our starting tissue be for endochondrial ossification? Island cartilage? Yeah. All right, see the difference there? Just saying that intramembranous ossification occurs in a fibrous membrane isn't a comparison. But if I say that intramembranous ossification starts in a fibrous membrane, whereas endochondrial ossification starts in hyaline cartilage, that is a comparison. So we wanna make sure, right, just saying that one is and the other nah -uh, isn't a comparison, right? We wanna make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. And so that is a great starting point with the starting tissue. What's another characteristic? And actually, I'm gonna make this smaller so we have more space for all of these. 
What's another way that endocon? And again, if you can't think of the characteristic, tell me another way these two are different from each other. Can they divide, um, divide and produce another cell? Well, but remember, in both of these, we have mesenchymal cells dividing to produce it. So that, so that does occur, uh, the same in both of them, right? So in both of these, that's the way that they're similar. Both use the division of mesenchymal cells to be able to produce new osteoblasts, to produce the new cells that we need. Type of bone that it forms in the end. Excellent. The type of bone. What type of bone do... Uh, endochondrial ossification form. Well, most bones, we said that, but in particular, long bones. Whereas exactly, this is flat bones of the skull, mandible, stuff like that. Excellent. It's so another way they're different. The number of ossification centers. Oh, I like that. How many ossification centers total do we have in endochondrial ossification? Three. Three. All right. One primary and two secondary. How many do we have in intramembranous? Many. Many, lots, I like that, lots. Perfect, excellent. Excellent, get lots and all around the same time, whereas obviously their primary and secondary occur at different times. Whereas with intramembranous ossification, we're talking about differences of, right, hours, days, right, for this process. The difference between when the primary and the secondary occur is dramatically different. We're talking about months in that case. Excellent. I like that. I can think of two more really big ones. Could we say that the organizing structure is different? Um, well, remember, the organizing structures are different in compact bone and spongy bone. But remember, both of these bone formation types both make compact bone and spongy bone. So that's a great way to describe a difference between uh, spongy bone and compact bone, which again is another great essay question, uh, but that it wasn't necessarily relevant to this one. Can we say uh, expand tissue from within? Okay. In though. Yep. So, so if absolutely. So, if you think about it, uh, so let's let, let's change that slightly. Where the growth begins, right? If you think about, if you think about with our endochondrial ossification, you're right. It's in the center of the model. But if you also think about it, it is. So let's say it this way: where the growth begins in relation to the periosteum. With our endochondrial ossification, it occurs in the uh, diaphysis, <clears throat> which is under the periosteum. So if you think about it here, the periosteum forms first. Does the periosteum form before the bone is made here in our intramembranous ossification? No, it's made after the after the fibers are pushed aside. Excellent. Here, right, the growth occurs in the membrane. And as it occurs in the membrane, as you said, it pushes the fibers out and forms the periosteum. So here, the periosteum forms after the bone. Whereas here, the periosteum forms first, 
before the bone. Now, technically, it's a perichondrium when it's forming before the bone, but it's still a dense irregular connective tissue that is there with the mesenchymal cells, and it's there first before the bone than the others. And what, what is it in endochondrial ossification? What caused all of the big changes? In endochondrial ossification, something happened three times that caused all of the changes. What was that thing that occurred three times? Could it be the blood vessels? Blood vessels. So notice with endochondrial ossification, the blood vessels grew in to the environment and then the bone formed. Is that what happened in intramembranous ossification? No. No, here the bone formed first and then the blood vessels grew into the spaces. So when the blood vessels enter, is another big difference between these two tissues. All right. Those were the two big ones that I was trying to think of. Can anybody think of any other differences? The medullary cavity. Oh, excellent, right? Uh, endochondrial ossification includes the formation of a medullary cavity, whereas intramembranous ossification does not include the formation of a medullary cavity. Excellent. It stays filled with spongy bone. Right? So notice we could have changed the wording of that too. Here this one, center stays spongy bone. Whereas here, spongy bone in center is removed to form a medullary cavity, All right? We are comparing these things to each other. Excellent. And I'm sure there's probably three or four more things we could come up with as well. Again, this does not have to be the format. But what I do not want on the exam, if you get the question where it says, give me four characteristics that are different between endochondrial ossification and intramembranous ossification, if you describe the entire process of endochondrial ossification and the entire process of intramembranous ossification, you give me tremendous amounts of information and all of it could be correct. The problem is it doesn't answer the question. Now I will go through there and try to tease out the pieces where you are comparing them, but just describing the processes isn't gonna be a comparison. It is important if I ask you comparison type questions to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. So even if you don't write it, think in terms of, all right, what is the characteristic I am trying to compare with these two processes or structures or tissues or whatever? And that can help you to stay focused uh, that you're comparing apples to apples on that type of question. All right. Questions on that. Also, can we say like uh, the uh, intramembrane, membranous uh, uh, ossification is not a purposeful sequence? It happens everywhere? Well, uh, so again, it's not so much that it isn't purposeful, but we don't have a meanful. It's not like dominoes where one hits the next and one hits the next and one hits the next, right? So it, there isn't a, so when we talk about the number of ossification centers, these are all occurring at the same time. You were, you were correct and then there is not a purposeful order to their formation, Right? But since the goal is to form a bone of a particular shape, it isn't happening just completely randomly. It's the timing that is not pur purposeful. So really when we're talking about it not being purposeful, we're, we're talking about the timing of their formation. Not where do they form so much as which one occurs first. Here, it's not meaningful which one occurs first. Whereas clearly in endochondrial ossification, it is very meaningful which one occurs first.
All right. And I'll give you more than that, Max. Some questions on this. All right, this is all I have for a lecture for you for today. So again, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time uh, to uh, work in our groups. No, I'm not gonna save this one because it's not a drawing, it's just words and you guys should be able to read, write this down, but here's what I will do for you. I will leave this slide up when we go to our break so that if you want to uh, write it down yourself, you'll have the chance to do this. Here is what is gonna happen. We are gonna take our second break uh, and also as we take the second break, so we are going to then, I'm going to, during the break, break you guys up into your groups. This way the people that are, are presenting today will have an opportunity to meet with their group, talk about what they're gonna do, get their stuff organized, and we'll do that for about 10 or 15 minutes and then we will come together uh, as a class. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and we'll take a 10 minute break, or a 15 minute break and then 10 minute prep time. So that's 25 minutes from now. So uh, for argument's sake, we'll say 1045. So at 1045, what I will do is I will break down the groups. We will come back together as a group and then we will have our group presentations of the bone and bone features. You should have your handout uh, of the bones and bone features readily available so that you can go through that. And again, those of you who are presenting have your files or your PowerPoint presentations or however you are doing that you're gonna to wanna to have that as well. Uh, there are two things that I ask, is that as always, please feel free to ask questions uh, during this. I will be helping uh, to try to do this. Remember, you're not being graded on your presentation skills. You just have to present this information for us. This is a graded activity. And what I ask is that you give people your undivided attention. Uh, try to keep the distractions to a minimum because uh, again, not everybody necessarily is as comfortable talking in front of a group as I am. Uh, I'm old and jaded and uh, barely care about you people at all. So whereas I know a lot of people are much more nervous when they're doing this. And also towards that end, I will not be recording the group presentations. Because again, I know not everybody necessarily is as comfortable presenting this way. And I want to make it as, um, as, uh, as, as less, as, as I want to minimize the stress of these presentations as much as possible so we can focus on the learning processes. And so that is going to be the other reason why it's going to be important to pay attention to this because this isn't something that you're going to be able to go back and view because like I said, I don't, I know not everybody is necessarily comfortable uh, speaking and don't want it necessarily to have it recorded. And so I want everybody to be as comfortable as they can be with these presentations. All right, so like I said, we will meet back here at 1045. But uh, what's gonna happen is I will leave this here for about 10 minutes. Uh, and then while I'm doing that, that will give me a chance to get your groups all set up and arranged. Uh, then in about 10 minutes, so at 1030, I will move you uh, into your group rooms and then you guys will have a chance to do some work and do some organization for that. And then we will return at 1045 for the group presentations. All right, any questions on any of that? All right, I'll see you guys in a few minutes.